Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, our speaker tonight is Stephen L. Quast. Steve Quast is a retired Air Force General and former commander of the Air Education and Training Command at Joint Base San Antonio Randolph. A graduate of the United States Air Force Academy with a degree in astronautical engineering, he holds a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He is a past president of the Air Force's Air University in Montgomery, Alabama, and a former fighter pilot with extensive combat and command experience. He is the author of the study, Fast Space, Leveraging Ultra-Low-Cost Space Access for 21st Century Challenges. And tonight he will be speaking on the urgent need for a U.S. Space Force. Please join me in welcoming Steve Quast. Just like Germany was competition for the airplane, the tank, and the nuclear weapon that we eventually won, but at great cost, China is our competition. Russia is our competition. They see the power of the economy of space in these four sectors, and they are rushing to that future. And there is no guardian force in America, but there is in China. China has already built the organization and has the strategy and the doctrine, the technology and the builders for their guardian force of space. They are building a navy in space with the equivalent of battleships and destroyers that will be able to maneuver and kill and communicate with dominance. And we are not. Now, this analogy might help clarify the picture going back to my original comment of what's really going on here. The competition is not about making better satellites or even having a constellation of satellites. When you see China on the far side of the moon mapping today the minerals and the resources so that they can eventually have infrastructure to build and 3D print and have a manufacturing industry in space, what you are watching is the equivalent of us sitting here on our continental United States, let's say we're in Miami, and we're looking out over the wide open ocean. That ocean is deep space. The orbit around the Earth is the shoreline where the waves are crashing. The deep water is space. And there is a continent out there three times the size of Africa. That's the moon. And nobody lives there. It's only three days away. It has massive amounts of everything that Mother Earth has, to include water on the South Pole in the craters greater than the Great Lakes as far as volume. And China is racing with ships on that open ocean to that great, open, desolate place that can be turned into resources and blessing for a marketplace. And they're doing it not just to get the resources, but to tap into the trillion dollar markets on planet Earth. Imagine what you could do if you could sell technology to somebody from China and deliver Wi-Fi. And once you've built the infrastructure in space, you can deliver it for pennies. Electricity, where your satellite dish doesn't just get direct TV now, it gets energy. It supplies your Chinese batteries and capacitors as they're building to get radio waves from space that give you that energy over time. They will tap into those trillion dollar markets as they have in the past, as we have in the past, and fund their ecosystem, their economy, their marketplace in cislunar space, which is basically the distance between the Earth and the moon and beyond. And we, as an American society, we are sitting on Miami Beach, sipping our pina colada, looking out at the waves, and as we are watching China build this navy with battleships and destroyers going out into the open oceans and off to this continent three times the size of Africa, we are building buoys and lighthouses, which are the satellites. They can see and hear what's going on, but can't do a darn thing about that rover on the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon, that if we were to try to go there, they could shoot us down. And speed matters. Speed matters, because whoever gets to the new market 
sets the values for that market. And we could either have the market with the values of our Constitution where every human being is created equal and loved equally by God and their parents and their brothers and sisters, and that respect is manifested in the rights of an individual to vote, to own land, to bear arms, all the things the Constitution gives us, or we can have the values that we see manifest in China, Hong Kong, the Uyghurs. You pick your example of subordination and crushing religion and human rights and human dignity and human liberty. But America is such a good-hearted country, we oftentimes are deceived by the nature of China's strategy. Their strategy is not to make better satellites. Their strategy is to build an economy before we do. Because if you get there first, they will be able to, with a constellation in space, see and kill anything that flies above the trees. The blood and treasure required to get back to that high ground, if we are not there first, will pale in comparison to World War II and World War I in ways that only those that study this technology and its power can know. Because China has met, for 30 years, they have met every single milestone of their space program. And in the next 10 years, they will have solar and nuclear power generation space stations on orbit. They broadcast that they will be used for peaceful purposes, that those radio waves will bring energy to anybody on planet Earth without the need for power lines or power plants. But in a millisecond, that dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum can be directed energy that could paralyze any part of our power grid and freeze any military might America builds on the spot. Every carrier battle fleet is a cork in the water. Every fleet of fighters is dead on the ramp, can't even turn a wheel because of our vulnerability. China has openly stated they are weaponizing everything Western civilization was built on, energy and information. And 5G is a perfect example. If you don't think they will act in a way that steals our ideas and our technology, duplicates it, and then dominates the marketplace, take a look at 5G. Nobody 20 years ago would have ever believed that America would not have an answer to 5G when China rolled it out. So Riley is an example of our future, and uh, that's really what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but history does repeat itself, so Michael, I have your speech, and that's the one I'm going to give tonight. So uh, <laughs> you, you should probably recognize it a bit. But Riley, thank you, and uh, you truly are the future. And that's why this is such a happy conversation. But it's also one reason why it's such an important conversation. Because life has always been a competition ultimately a competition of values. And everything else is wrapped around that. But when we ask this question about, do we need a space force? I'd like to unpack that a little bit because it's important to first start with why. Why do we need a space force? And once we understand why we need a space force, then we can talk about, well, when do we need it? And what should it do? critical elements of this central question we're going to explore this evening, and I'm looking forward to your questions. But one of the most important points of thinking is first understanding what's going on around you. What, what, what's happening? What is the context here? Why is this important? And as a historian, uh, reflecting on the fact that throughout the history of mankind, at least everything we can read and understand, technology has always changed world power whether it was the caveman that figured out how to harness the power of fire to keep his or her tribe warm and survive the cold winters and cook the food so they didn't die from bacteria and other things. They had a competitive advantage, and their DNA survived. Their values survived. To the invention of the airplane, the nuclear weapon, you take a look at any technology that has been optimized by a certain tribe, civilization, 
it can become a tool of national power that changes world power. Space is going to change world power because of the power of space and what it can do. And we're going to explore that a little bit tonight. But it's also a story of human nature and culture. As a missionary kid growing up in a tribal African area, I can tell you that world paradigms clash and they, they can trap a civilization into a certain world paradigm. And this, this human nature will not only embrace something that helps them, but it also will reject anything new. And this idea of a space force is very new and is experiencing the same. But this is not new in time. A small island nation like England could dominate the world economy and become the most powerful military, economic, and political force on planet Earth as a small island nation because they optimize the development of deep sea navigation and sail and ships and a navy. But the story of rejecting new and holding and clinging to the paradigms of the past is why no civilization has ever lasted forever. And values are trumped by other values when another civilization figures out a way of finding a competitive advantage. And in England, probably the most famous story is World War I. In 1914, the English were hungry to go to war with Germany because they were certain that their superior tactics and the Napoleonic method of warfare that they had, they had refined to a perfect art that had dominated the globe would dominate once again. And even though there were historians and technologists and strategists that pointed out the machine gun and the development of poison gas, the leadership said, we don't have time for that. The courage, the nobility, and the aggressiveness of our fighters will overcome. Our single rifles will just overwhelm that machine gun nest, and we'll just hold our breath and run through the gas and fight on the other side. And after England lost an entire generation of Englishmen, they turned to their most respected intellect, Dr. Fisher, and asked the question, why did we lose an entire generation? And he said, you didn't lose because you had inferior technology. Your technology, you had the best technology on planet Earth. It wasn't your tactics. Your tactics were perfect. You lost an entire generation because of a lack of vision and strategy. Sun Tzu, in The Art of War, talks about this. It's not about the technology. It's about the strategy. And so here we sit today. Back in that day, the historians and the technologists brought to the leadership of England this council that they needed to invest in the machine gun and gas, or at least find ways of fighting through those, because those would change the character of war. And they ignored it, saying, we've got time. We've been the best, so we will be the best, projecting the past into the future. We do the same today. And this community in America brought the technologies that are emerging and the strategies that are emerging internationally and domestically to this administration. And this administration said, build a space force. But the reason space is so powerful is not that it just has a military application like a machine gun. It's because it will transform the four major engines of economic growth that have been consistent throughout mankind. Transportation, information, manufacturing, and probably most important, the ability to deliver that transportation and information with energy. Energy, the seed corn of all development, all growth, all survival, survival energy. So energy, transportation, information, and manufacturing, these are the things that change humanity, that will change world power, and they are descending upon us in ways that are very unique. The technology is on the engineering benches today, but most Americans and most in Congress have not had time to really look deeply at what's going on here. 
But I've had the benefit of 33 years of studying and becoming friends with these engineers and these scientists. This technology can be built today with technology that is not developmental to deliver any human being from any place on planet Earth to any other place in less than an hour, to deliver Wi-Fi from space where you never need a cell tower to connect, to deliver energy from space where you never have to plug your phone in and it trickle charges and you can use that energy over time. It can be applied to cars, to houses, the technology of Edison and Tesla that we live with in our energy environment, our paradigm today, is expensive, it's dangerous, and it's wasteful. Plug it into the wall, but yet that's all what we all do because we are used to paradigms. The power of space will change world power forever. And it doesn't have to be a big country to do it. It can be a small island country, let's say New Zealand, because the technology, if optimized, can change world power, and there's nothing you can do if you don't have that power. The nature of power. You either have it and your values rule, or you do not have it and you must submit. We see that play out again and again in history, and it's playing out now. But we get trapped. Here in America, for example, three times in the last hundred years, we have failed to optimize the technologies that were coming about to our own peril. In 1920, the country turned to General Pershing and General MacArthur. That's the father, MacArthur, the two Medal of Honor recipients, father and son. In 1920, they asked them the question, should the airplane be developed independently? Should the tank and mechanization be developed independently? And they said, absolutely not. And they dictated that the airplane and the tank must be developed by the infantry because the infantry is the main event. The Signal Corps is the main event. And that fatal decision by the most respected and heralded heroes of the age cost thousands of lives in World War II because the development of the airplane and the tank were insufficient for the competition. And at that time, it was Germany. We lost more airmen in the European theater than all of the Marines in World War II. And the number of young men we intentionally had to slaughter in the Sherman tank, which it, its shell would bounce off the Panzer and the Tiger tank. We had to literally and knowingly sacrifice an entire frontal attack to be eviscerated by the German tank lines to get enough Shermans around the back, which at close range from behind was the only way to kill a Panzer or a Tiger with a Sherman tank. And that's because the people developing the tank and the airplane, every extra dollar was spent on the infantry and a better gun because that was the main event. The tank was not meant as a main event. It was meant to protect the infantry. The airplane was not the main event. It was to spot troops for the Signal Corps. It was not intended by anybody. The biggest trap of culture is mindset. And we get trapped in a mindset like electricity, that it has to be that way. Our children will be plugging into a wall when the technology does not need to be that way. But here's why space is so much more powerful and why this question of the Space Force is so important. It's because we have competition today. If the development of space to do these things that I just described to you, transform the trans trans uh, transportation economy, to be able to deliver anybody anywhere on planet Earth in less than an hour. Transform the energy market where everybody can trickle charge their batteries and capacitors to power anything on planet Earth from anywhere without any power lines, any power plants. Trans transform information where you can get information about what's going around you and you don't need to be near a city or near a cell tower because you're delivering it from a network in space that can deliver it to every human being and that we can manufacture things in space using the vacuum and zero G to not only do research medically, but to build facilities and structures in ways we could have never done before and deliver them as light as a feather anywhere on planet Earth for pennies on the dollar of transportation costs in a linear sea, land, and air friction environment. And whenever humanity has a new marketplace like this, 
if there is not some guardian force that brings predictability to that economic marketplace, violence ensues. Pirates, thieves, and thugs steal what good men and women build. And it's just a part of human nature. And that will not change. So as we look to these new markets and we see Elon Musk building a starship that will be able to launch from anywhere and go anywhere in less than an hour with massive volume and weight. And he throws up 12,000 satellites that will bring you Wi-Fi from space where you will laugh at the, your uh, descendants or your, your uh, fathers and mothers that had to rely on cell towers or see the little circle of death waiting for signal. They will laugh and scoff at that. They will laugh and scoff that you had to put fuel into your tank and your car or plug into a wall because your phone was running out of juice in the airports. The lines waiting for the outlet are no more. We get trapped in these paradigms. But yet, just like Germany was competition for the airplane, the tank, and the nuclear weapon that we eventually won, but at great cost, China is our competition. Russia is our competition. They see the power of the economy of space in these four sectors. And they are rushing to that future. And there is no guardian force in America. But there is in China. China has already built the organization and has the strategy and the doctrine, the technology, and the builders for their guardian force of space. They are building a navy in space with the equivalent of battleships and destroyers that will be able to maneuver and kill and communicate with dominance. And we are not. Now, this analogy might help clarify the picture going back to my original comment of what's really going on here. The competition is not about making better satellites or even having a constellation of satellites. When you see China on the far side of the moon mapping today the minerals and the resources so that they can eventually have infrastructure to build and 3D print and have a manufacturing industry in space, what you are watching is the equivalent of us sitting here on our continental United States, let's say we're in Miami, and we're looking out over the wide open ocean. That ocean is deep space. The orbit around the Earth is the shoreline where the waves are crashing. The deep water is space. And there is a continent out there three times the size of Africa. That's the moon. And nobody lives there. It's only three days away. It has massive amounts of everything that Mother Earth has to include water on the South Pole in the craters greater than the Great Lakes as far as volume. And China is racing with ships on that open ocean to that great, open, desolate place that can be turned into resources and blessing for a marketplace. And they're doing it not just to get the resources, but to tap into the trillion dollar markets on planet Earth. Imagine what you could do if you could sell technology to somebody from China and deliver Wi-Fi. And once you've built the infrastructure in space, you can deliver it for pennies. Electricity, where your satellite dish doesn't just get direct TV now, it gets energy that supplies your Chinese batteries and capacitors as they're building to get radio waves from space that give you that energy over time. They will tap into those trillion dollar markets as they have in the past, as we have in the past, and fund their ecosystem, their economy, their marketplace in cislunar space, which is basically the distance between the Earth and the moon and beyond. And we, as an American society, we are sitting on Miami Beach, sipping our pina colada, looking out at the waves, and as we are watching China build this navy with battleships and destroyers going out into the open oceans and off to this continent three times the size of Africa, we are building buoys and lighthouses, which are the satellites. They can see and hear what's going on, but can't do a darn thing about that rover on the backside of the moon, the far side of the moon, 
that if we were to try to go there, they could shoot us down. And speed matters. Speed matters because whoever gets to the new market sets the values for that market. And we could either have the market with the values of our Constitution where every human being is created equal and loved equally by God and their parents and their brothers and sisters, and that respect is manifested in the rights of an individual to vote, to own land, to bear arms, all the things the Constitution gives us, or we can have the values that we see manifest in China, Hong Kong, the Uyghurs. You pick your example of subordination and crushing religion and human rights and human dignity and human liberty. But America is such a good-hearted country, we oftentimes are deceived by the nature of China's strategy. Their strategy is not to make better satellites. Their strategy is to build an economy before we do. Because if you get there first, they will be able to, with a constellation in space, see and kill anything that flies above the trees. The blood and treasure required to get back to that high ground, if we are not there first, will pale in comparison to World War II and World War I in ways that only those that study this technology and its power can know. Because China has met, for 30 years, they have met every single milestone of their space program. And in the next 10 years, they will have solar and nuclear power generation space stations on orbit. They broadcast that they will be used for peaceful purposes, that those radio waves will bring energy to anybody on planet Earth without the need for power lines or power plants. But in a millisecond, that dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum can be directed energy that could paralyze any part of our power grid and freeze any military might America builds on the spot. Every carrier battle fleet is a cork in the water. Every fleet of fighters is dead on the ramp, can't even turn a wheel because of our vulnerability. China has openly stated they are weaponizing everything Western civilization was built on, energy and information. And 5G is a perfect example. If you don't think they will act in a way that steals our ideas and our technology, duplicates it, and then dominates the marketplace, take a look at 5G. Nobody 20 years ago would have ever believed that America would not have an answer to 5G when China rolled it out. Why didn't we have it? Well, it's pretty easy. China invited companies like Lucent Technology, Motorola, Nortel, into China with a nice package of benefits at the cost of proprietary information, intellectual property. And they built Huawei out of the bankrupt carcasses of those three companies. They stole the technology, they duplicated it, and then they dominated the marketplace in an unfair way. Unfair, perfect example, Vietnam in 2006. They were bidding for companies to come build their telecommunication infrastructure. And so all these companies that were world-class global leaders in telecommunications put out their bids, competitive bids. Huawei's bid, as a young company being grown by the Communist Party, zero dollars. They built it for free. How do you compete with that? The same thing is happening with the space industry right now. If you're a, a German that wants a satellite, China will give it to you for free if you buy their satellite, and they'll give you the launch for 90% discount, far below what the market can bear, because they can funnel their political focus, their military focus, and their financial focus into a vision and a plan that does not suffer from the blessing of our republic, where parties come and go, programs get crushed, they come back, and you can't plan one year to the other, or some years you can't plan at all with a continuing resolution, where you can't do anything new, and you don't have any money to do it. This is the difference in strategy. A strategy of speed to get to this new continent of wealth called the moon and asteroids and a cislunar economy to bring power to whatever country dominates that economy. 
It's like America is a race car that has been winning races for 70 years since World War II. We're going 90 miles an hour, and we've done it that way since World War II. It's our entire mindset, our entire lives the same way. China is in a car right behind us. The car isn't as good, but it's going 120 miles an hour. We can say today we are dominant in space. But the trend lines is what you have to look at. And they will pass us in the next few years if we do not do something. And they will win this race, and then they will put roadblocks up to space. Because once you get the ultimate high ground, that strategic high ground, it's curtains for anybody trying to get to that high ground behind them. Because they can apply power, maneuver, and communication at infinitesimally lower price points. And ultimately, everything is economic. If you can do something cheaper than I can do it, you will eventually beat me. And all national security comes from economies. So speed is essential. So we are building brilliant satellites. We are building brilliant commands. But we will be like taking a, a, a glorified knife to a tank fight or the perfect single action rifle to a machine gun fight because of the strategy is not fighting China's strategy, and we are stuck in our mindset of the last 70 years and what space has done so far. This is not a military race. This is an economic race. And if you do not have a guardian force to bring rule of law and predictability, no venture capitalist will know how to make risk decisions. No company will be able to invest. And those that do will have their hard work stolen away because the rule of law is not codified by a guardian force. The good news is there are more societies on planet Earth that share our values as an American society that will work with us to do this. But right now, we're paralyzed. Look at what's happening in our government. Yes, argument is good, but we are paralyzed. This National Defense Authorization Act is at, is at risk. And even though, even though this president was able to get a space force into the dialogue. When he first said it, the bureaucracy howled with resistance. And only after a year and a half of hard work are they now on board. Just an example of the resistance to the status quo, wanting the status quo to stay what it is. But it's ironic because it reminds me of a story in 1400 that is an example that there's nothing new under the sun, and history may not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme, that old saying that uh, is clever but true. In 1400, China had a two-party system, Ming Dynasty. A party in power saw this thing called a navy and said, that is powerful, because that navy fleet will mean that the ocean is not a barrier, but rather a highway to new marketplaces. And they built the biggest navy on planet Earth. They would have been the England of 1400 had they finished the job. But the bickering of politics, when the new party came into power, they burned every ship to the ground in spite, because the other party's idea was the idea for a navy and not theirs. That began, began a 600-year journey to the century of humiliation. And I'm here to tell you, I read every document that comes out of China. I read every speech by every senior policy official. And I will tell you, they talk about this story and that the Middle Kingdom is back and America is in its crosshairs. And space is the navy for the 21st century economy, a networked economy that will dominate any linear terrestrial economy in the four engines of growth and dominance that change world power, transportation, information, energy, and manufacturing. And they are building that infrastructure. They are unapologetic about it. And they plan on declaring victory as the dominant world power in space at the 100-year anniversary, 2049. And in the next 10 years, 
their energy in space with nuclear and solar power that can be beamed to the Earth for good and for bad, their ability to control gateways of 5G using space, quantum, artificial intelligence, supercomputing, to be able to shape the perception of the world and to tell any story and to lie about America or anybody else that is counter to their purpose. And you see how our interdependency as a world plays out when China can lie about America to all global markets and how that affects our economy and our stock market. Ultimately, it is the manifestation of a long, patient plan to dominate information and energy as weapons against the West so China's Middle Kingdom can come back. This is why we need a Space Force. This is why it needs to be now because if we fumble the football politically this year, it'll be two years before we get another National Defense Authorization Act that will give this a chance to survive. And that's two years of money in the bank at compound interest for China, who's furiously swimming away to that continent of Africa as we're sitting on the beaches of Miami, admiring the tide and our buoys and lighthouses that can see exactly what's going on on the shoreline in our orbit. Why do we need a Space Force? Because it's an economic competition for the values of the future. When do we need it? Now. What does it need to do? It doesn't have to have war fighting capability. It has to be able to defend the economy of space. A Coast Guard, a merchant marine for space. Because the national security muscles and capabilities will flow easily once we tap into the profits of those marketplaces. Just like we have a strong navy because we have a strong shipbuilding industry and a strong merchant marine, and just because we have a strong air force because the aerospace industry is our largest export as a nation. This is what long-term strategy and economic power look like, and this is what we need. And the scientists, engineers, historians, and strategists of our age have brought this to our government the government has said, do it, and now Congress is asking the question, why do we need to spend money on a Space Force? It would be like Teddy Roosevelt getting pushed back, saying, why do we need a Panama Canal? Why do we need an Eisenhower interstate system? It's for commerce, the power of the perpetuation of the American dream and the American values. You are at a pivotal point. The American people don't know this story. Congress doesn't even know this story adequately except for a few. And if we don't get this story out, your grandchildren will probably be speaking Chinese. That's not a bad language because the Chinese people are beautiful people. But their Communist Party will murder the future generations of free-loving people. Liberty can be snuffed out if we are not mindful of the power of technology and the trap of a mindset that clings to the status quo instead of allowing our engineers and our inventors and our marketplaces build a new future with new paradigms to dominate the, the marketplaces of the 21st century. Thank you for your time and for listening, and I look forward to your questions. See, that speech you wrote was awesome, Michael. <laughs> my, my question is rhetorical, which is we've seen a lot of uh, news lately about career officers, uh, foreign service officers, so-called deep staters in the National Security Council. I have my misgivings about that, but then I ask, if we're going to have them, why can't we have this guy? Uh, okay, questions, and there are microphones uh, roving around, so please wait until you're handed a mic before you... That you way the audience can hear the question and, and people online. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Could you describe the nature of uh, th this? All gets to the SAP level almost immediately. So, but for everybody's uh, edification, could you describe the uh, our offensive and defensive capabilities in space versus those that our adversaries currently have and what they will have in the very near future? Okay. So everybody heard that question. I will tell you that. Uh, uh, whether you're an Army officer, a Naval officer, an Air Force officer, a Coast Guard officer, a Marine officer, it doesn't matter. There's one truth about a new domain, 
if you want to dominate it and you want to bring rule of law. You have to be able to maneuver more aggressively and at cheaper price points than your competition. You have to be able to communicate more ubiquitously and more resiliently than your competition. And you have to be able to bring power to bear, whether that's kinetic power, informational power, non-kinetic power. You have to be able to bring power to bear. And you have to do all of those three things cheaper and faster than your competition. And you have to be able to deny your competition those three things. China is feverishly working on those three components <clears throat> to be applied outside of the gravity well. That's beyond the orbits into the moon and the cislunar space using the sun as their source of energy that is perpetual and can be beamed to any place in that ecosystem. They are literally building the coal stations equivalent to the ones we built in the Pacific when Teddy Roosevelt built the Great White Fleet with iron ships instead of wooden ships. In fact, that story is another one. The wooden ship builders and the sail, sail builders did not want to let go of the wooden ship. It was better than these stinky old iron ships. That was another journey of a new paradigm that had to crush an old paradigm and it was hard and long. So I will tell you this, everything I've said is in the open press, but much of it has to be translated from Mandarin and that's another problem our journalists and our American public has in understanding what's going on. But I will tell you this, 33 years of studying technology, the Chinese, culture, history, human nature, China is feverishly developing capability to dominate those three areas in cislunar space, and we are not. We are perfecting orbital mechanics, the shoreline work, precision, quality, brilliant capability and equipment, but irrelevant to China that can maneuver outside the gravity well, around the backside of the moon, and there's nothing we can do if we are not dominant in that geography as well. So that's why the Space Force is so urgent, because China's got a head start. They're that car right on our bumper, going 120 miles an hour. It won't be better than what we'll build, because we have an open market, free economy. Ideas flourish, but China steals them so fast, duplicates them so rapidly, floods the market so insidiously that even the brilliant idea like what Tesla did with their battery that China stole and duplicated, even a brilliant idea like that, we're behind the power curve. 5G, we have no answer because China took all our stuff, built it, flooded the market, and now if you're a company that doesn't have 5G, you can't compete because speed is life in the 21st century and we don't have an answer. Germany wants it. We would love as an American country to give them some 5G with the values of America behind it, but they only have one option and that's China. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you decide who goes. Okay. Right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll Sorry, she is much better looking than you are. <laughs> that's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for your speech. I'm also one of the WIP students here. Um, and my question is you've talked a lot about the two competing paradigms, how there's the old one and the new one. Um, and the famous scientific philosopher Thomas Kuhn often spoke about how these paradigms are incommensurable to each other, meaning that if you're in one paradigm, you can't understand what someone's saying from another paradigm. Mm -hmm. How do you propose that we bridge that gap to bring people from the old way of viewing things into the new way in a manner that's effective and that helps us spread our values around the world? That's a great question and uh, this is something that I'm so glad you asked because um, history gives us all the answers to this question. And one of the reasons why I was fortunate enough to uh, see this is because I grew up in a different world paradigm. I was raised in a, a tribe. I didn't have to go to school, which explains a lot, by the way. <laughs> Still can't write or spell very well. But, uh, I, I, and then coming to a different world paradigm at a, a fragile young age allowed me to see how devastating the communication gap can be between paradigms. And we as civilizations build a paradigm like energy, let's say, the electricity that we have delivered, and we squirrel away at inventing and innovating within that paradigm, and nobody looks outside to say, hey, is there a different economic curve here we can jump to? But there are enough people in our society that know how to jump to that curve. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, God rest his soul, Paul Allen, okay? 
Luckily, they have the money to actually do something, but they were rebels. They were mavericks. They were uh, ridiculed until they proved it. Okay? So, this, is, this played out with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When we saw that Germany was pursuing the bomb, and we knew that if they got that bomb first, it was intuitive that we had to be fast. FDR did not turn to the bureaucracy of the army and say, build me a bomb, because he knew the status quo and the bureaucratic organizations never can jump out of their paradigm. The pig does not slaughter itself, okay? You have to get outsiders. That's why Congress and the executive branch have always been the ones that have changed the military, not inside. So what FDR did is he found the right leader, and that was Oppenheimer. He, Eisenhower did the same thing. As the Soviet Union was rearing its ugly head, and the army was suggesting putting a million soldiers with bayonets affixed in the folded gap of Germany, Eisenhower said, no, because one tactical nuke will kill all my sons and daughters, and I can't afford it. And he turned to two innovators, General Schriever and Admiral Rickover, and he said, build me a nuclear triad so that we can have a balance. Now, mutual assured destruction is no happy way of going through life, but it was a way of having a bulwark against this devastating technology. The same is true today. We need a Manhattan-type project in order to develop this properly because the price of entry to space is so high that only billionaires that are willing to pour their own money into it are making any progress. But they are hounded and blocked at every turn. Elon Musk, for example, has to pay the Air Force $13 million every time he launches from Vandenberg Air Force Base for no good reason, just risk aversion in a bureaucracy. And when everything goes perfect, he doesn't get that money back. They use it for their own coffers and their own things. But that's the cover your butt kind of mentality that happens in a bureaucracy that cannot jump outside of the paradigm. There's no other way. Turn into the government or the bureaucracy to do this will not work. But an executive branch or a Congress that's willing to pick the right leader that understands the technology, the history, the culture, the paradigm, and picks the right engineers and scientists, they'll build it because there's nothing more powerful than the American free enterprise that welcomes diversity of thought and will try things and fail. And no communist party is going to shoot them if they fail. If they fail for the right reasons, they are promoted. If they fail for the wrong reasons, you coach them. And if they fail three times, you fire them. <laughs> Admiral, for example, General Schriever, as he was building the missile fields of our nuclear triad, the first 13 rockets blew up, okay? Only Eisenhower was able to protect him from the hounds of Congress and the Air Force that hated him, that wanted him out, that felt that his work was coming at the cost of the man bomber. History is playing out again. Did that answer your question? Who's next? Um, yeah, go ahead. Your mic is coming. Hi, I'm Jacob Rich from Reason Foundation. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm curious. So you said that China's already started building destroyers and other military vessels for space. And I'm just curious, should we uh, steal their intellectual property to catch up? Well, I will tell you that uh, this is the uh, insidious nature of strategy versus equipment, OK? Um, so China is building nuclear thermal power propulsion capabilities to be able to maneuver in space. We know how to do that, and we can do it better. Their stuff is not good. Now, 5G is good. The 5G technology is good because it's our stuff. But the stuff they're building is not better than what we can build. It's not about equipment. It's not about stealing their ideas because their ideas are inferior to ours. It's the fact that they're building an entire method of being able to have a blanket of power over America in space that can bring directed energy to paralyze our power grids, paralyze our cars, paralyze our military, uh, disrupt our markets. They're doing it on a social level with the Confucius centers and a narrative. The small space companies, for example, I could bring in the CEOs of the small space companies and here's what's happening to them. There'll be somebody that come up to them and say, I will give you a billion dollars if you put me on your board. And when they follow the money, it was China. They gave them the money, gave an American that money and said, here's a billion dollars for free. 
go and get on the boards of these companies and uh, your only price tag is to bring me the intellectual property and the proprietary information. And so it's hard. A company will come to me and say, what do I do? And I'll say, do not take the money because you will sell your soul. This is where the government needs to help. The government needs to help make sure there's an even playing field economically or all these fragile new space companies will never build an industrial base equivalent to the aerospace industry or the shipbuilding industry that have made our nation free and strong for the last hundred years. And it will die on the crib. The Space Force and everything we need to do to protect this economy will die on the crib and China will own the information, the gateways, the technologies that flood all the other countries of the world, even our friends like Germany and England have 5G and are getting more and more of it. Our nuclear power plants have 5G technology in them. And those are all riddled with back doors and spyware that can see everything we're doing as a nation. We know it. This is like a slow growing vine around the spinal cord of America, insidiously and slowly, because that is the mindset of the Chinese strategy. It is not to fight. They don't want to fight. They want to dominate the economic prowess of America over 100 years, and we go out with a whimper. Over here. Uh, sure. Uh, so you mentioned the, the fact that oh, the executive and the Congress uh, affect the military to the same respect. Um, do you think changing the public's mind will be helpful as well? That's a great question, and yes. There, there are two groups of people that do not understand what's going on, the American people and Congress. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and again, uh, you know, I, re I retired in September, and I have been spending my in, every waking hour helping Congress understand what's going on here because it's essentially the same as China ignoring the Navy and regretting it 600 years later when their civilization rotted from within because of external players that stole away their values. Or England that lost an entire generation of men before they realized what the competition was really about. It wasn't about Napoleonic soldiers shoulder to shoulder on a parade field with courage. It was about the machine gun and gas and it killed them all. Deep regret. But they went into it enthusiastic. I mean, read the literature of the time, 1914. They couldn't wait to go die. They just didn't know they were going to die. They thought courage would save them. They underestimated the power of technology. We're doing the same right now. But the enemy is not as aggressive. China is passive. China is silent. China is insidious. China has a 100-year plan one step at a time, a slow growing vine that slowly paralyzes the competition. <laughs> so the American people need to know, they do not know. Help me get it to them. Congress doesn't fully know. And uh, the reason I know that is not only because I've been talking to them, some do, but they're still asking this question, why do we need a Space Force? It's a waste of money. We've got NASA. That would be like sending the wagon trains out west with no cavalry. Okay. See, I said something that inspi you know, inspired you to ask a question because you popped up. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, balance of power in the uh, Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. I think Japan should go nuclear. They won't. Maybe in five years, maybe 10 years. Uh, that, that's going to offset the Chinese advancing. That's what I think. OK, well, let me uh, talk to that, because that, um, I, I disagree fundamentally with that premise. And it's not that that wouldn't necessarily have a short-term benefit of deterrence. But the power of space does something really important here. And, and, and this is really where I'm going to end. But I'll just do a little slice of this, and then I'll end with the, the later part. And that is a vision. The power of space can do what Reagan was doing, and the physics just didn't quite close. Brilliant Pebbles was the program to put a space base layer that could see and kill any missile launched the moment we knew it was launched in a direction that was nefarious to American values. 
and it could be shot down before it even left the geographic boundaries of whichever place it was launched. You can build that off the shelf today, and we have not, and China is. So Japan going nuclear? No. What we could do if we, as an American society, decided to invest in the infrastructure of space for information for all Americans, reliable energy, information that's protected, by the way, because it's not the internet. You can build gateways that design trust into it, where every American can have their data without having to sacrifice their civil liberties. Energy that can be provided to anybody on planet Earth without strings attached, like they do with the Uyghurs and Hong Kong and any individual where they hold their parents hostage if they don't behave properly or they don't get to go to the right schools or they don't get to buy the food that's good. Space can make ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, literally antiques of past wars. And then I'll end with the other vision, but that's one vision. You can literally get, you, you can't get rid of nuclear weapons because you can always deliver them in a backpack or some other means. But you can deliver the capability to dominate marketplaces economically. And you can literally design a new world order that does not have so much violence built into our deterrence model, where if a civilization is threatening our values, we can deter them without violence in ways they cannot compete with. So I would rather not go the route of arming more people with more, more nuclear weapons. We don't have to go down that paradigm. That's getting trapped in the paradigm of the past. I want to move to a new paradigm where China can't follow and most other countries on planet Earth cannot follow either, but all of our friends will go with us and the Japanese are part of that. I mean, I don't to There's a very this. inquisitive question right here that I'm dying to hear. Okay. We'll get to them. Yeah, go ahead. Have we an idea of the cost of this initiative? Yeah, so the cost I'm of sure the initiative. I'm sure it'd be in phases, but. Right. So the cost is always the first question, and bureaucracy. Because right now, what has happened is our country has turned to our military and said, build a space force. And I guarantee you, it'll be bureaucratic, it'll be big, it'll be expensive, and it won't get the job done. That's the nature of a bureaucracy in the government. Now, it will maybe succeed in 50 years, but we don't have that luxury because our pacing has to be predicated on our competition, not on the fact that we have been unilaterally dominant economically for the last 70 years and we could do anything at any pace we wanted and we didn't have to care because nobody was competing. So here we are sitting on the shores of Miami Beach with our pina colada, okay? And we are like, oh, Space Force, eh. Eh, how much is it going to cost? I will tell you, you don't build the Space Force out of the coffers of the taxpayers' money. We built an automobile industry because it was so useful to people, the marketplace built it. The computer industry, the aerospace industry. Space is going to be so useful to all humanity. Trillion dollar markets in telecommunication. Trillion dollar markets in transportation. Speed is life, speed is money. How many people are willing to get from here to Singapore in 39 minutes instead of 39 hours? No, not quite that far. <laughs> so I am here to tell you that if this is done right, the strategy is to build the Space Force with the profits of the marketplaces that you dominate. And you've got partners in civil society. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. Elon Musk is going to dominate transportation and information with his Starship and his 13,000 satellites for Wi-Fi from space. We already have companies that are going to have texting from space next year. In fact, their test satellite is already up. And I don't need a cell tower to text. So this is the trick of free markets. You build it with the profits of the marketplace if you design it right. That's why all national security is foundationally economic. Hopefully. Private industry, absolutely. Those are the titans of innovation. They aren't bogged down by a culture of risk aversion that bakes into our government and our military, and they're willing to take risk. And those are the only ways of competing and winning in a real race. Risk and the willingness to fail. All right, this will be the last one. I'll let you I'd like this young lady right here to uh, <laughs> say a word. Well, I do too. <laughs> here, there's the mic. 
And if it's not a good question, I'll answer the question I want to answer. <laughs> instead. Right. Yeah. Um, my question is, what can we do to spread this information? Because I have, uh, this is not new. Uh, we get tidbits of this through the news media, but nothing to the extent that you have explained it tonight. This is critical it is. to the future of our country. Amen. This is it. Yeah. Um, this is where a, a, an educated electorate is so key to our Constitution that our founding fathers wrote about. Um, and do not underestimate the power of a network. Okay? One node touching three other nodes that touch three other nodes. It's the, the sage old uh, uh, story of a young man who really did something brilliant for the king and the king said, well, uh, I don't have a lot of money, but what can I do to repay you? And the man said, just give me one grain of rice on this chessboard, on this first square. And on the second square, give me two. And keep doubling it for every piece of the chessboard. <coughs> Now, many of you probably know this story. By the time you have gotten to the end of the chessboard squares, how much rice do you have? A lot. Pretty big amount. Okay, so the entire planet Earth, six feet high. That's the power of a network. And it's interesting that we, we end on a network because there's another important point about space. So the, to answer your question specifically is tell your friends and start reading. It is out there. It's just hard to find. And it's out there, but just recently in this way, because I couldn't write about this in the Air Force. Uh, the, the people do not want to scare the American people. And I, I don't want to scare them either. But for God's sakes, our future is at stake here. We are victims to a strategy we don't even recognize. And as a person who grew up in a different cultural paradigm, they can see this clearly and has studied this for 33 years. I am here to tell you, it is imminent. And the more we can be in the dark, the happier China is. Because then the coup de grace is done and it is fait accompli. And there's nothing we can do about it. And now, I believe that America is so energetic intellectually and so courageous that eventually we will fight our way back. But the English haven't even fought their way back from World War I. So it can happen. It can, the next 100 years, the values that will rule the next 100 years will be defined by this next 10 years and who dominates space. So here's the vision, though. This is why I started by saying this is such a happy story. Okay, you might think, oh my God, you know, doom and gloom. No. Here is the story. Every technology, even though people can use technology for evil, every technology has uplifted the human condition over time. If you, if, you, if you take a look at the human race, there are a higher percentage of human beings that have energy, water, security, food than ever before on planet Earth, ever. Now, there's more people, so there's more people in poverty than ever before. But the ratio is moving in a good direction. It's because there are more people that love their children and respect other people than there are evil people like Stalin and Lenin and Mao that would kill them for power. And this Constitution, I believe, is such a unique and ordained document that if we fumble the ball now because we don't pay attention to technology and how it can change world power, shame on us. But here's the vision. The vision is with a new paradigm that space could bring us if we built this infrastructure, if we had the vision to build the Panama Canal of our age, the infrastructure of space, we can bring clean and abundant energy affordable to every person on planet Earth with no power lines, no power plants required. Central Africa, where I grew up, that tribe could have information and energy right now. We have machines that can bring water out of the air with that energy from space, where you could just give them a piece of technology and they can have clean water with no pipes, no aquifers, no rivers required. You can bring trusted information to any person on planet Earth where they do not have to live with a scourge of an internet that was designed to be 
open and free, no security. Yet we are trapped in that paradigm, spinning ourselves into oblivion, into bankruptcy, trying to make something secure that was never designed to be secure. We could bring secure, trusted data to every human being on planet Earth, underpinned by American values and the American Constitution. We could bring medical healing because of research facilities in space that benefit from zero gravity and a vacuum that we can never do in, a, in, in the terrestrial realm without great cost and energy. The server farms in America that are growing exponentially, that are sucking energy beyond belief, could be put into space and no energy required because it's freezing up there. And the ability to communicate and compute the faster we can move to independent operations in space, the more secure we will be, the more differential power we will have as an economy and as a civilization to defend against terrorism and the despots of communism that are rearing their ugly head and trying to come after Western civilization and attacking the two foundational weaknesses we have built our entire prosperity on, energy and information, and both of them are at risk and both of them are unaffordable to fix. So don't struggle. We're struggling to get a secure grid, a resilient grid. We're struggling to get secure data and resilient data. Stop struggling. Let our inventors and our innovators design a new paradigm to uplift the human condition and have America underwrite it. And America will be the beneficiaries to the amount of trillions of dollars of profit to perpetuate those business cases to deliver every human being on planet Earth prosperity, and the blessing that we respect them no matter who they are, no matter what they believe, as long as they respect us. That's the vision. That's the joy, not the negative stuff. The negative stuff is only if good men and women do nothing. Then the negative stuff happens and we, we, we turn to our academicians and say, like they did to Dr. Fisher in England, why did we lose a generation of men? a lack of vision, a lack of strategy, not equipment. Their equipment was brilliant, but it wasn't a machine gun or gas, and they didn't even think about it. We're too courageous for that. We'll be just fine, just like we have been for the last 100 years. And that's what you hear today. You hear, we don't need a separate space force because we want to integrate it into the joint force and the army and the terrestrial fight. That's our purpose. Not even thinking beyond the orbits into cislunar space and the trillion dollar markets that will come from that. We are at a point in civilization where for the first time in human history, we can reach to the heavens, a gift God has given us for our resources, our energy, and our information in a way that we'll never have to scar the earth again for all those things we need. We need resources to feed our families and shelter our people. We need the ability to defend those things. We need the sense of belonging that comes with loving our families and our tribes. And we need to understand what's going on around us. Those are the only four things we need. Resources, defending the resources, a sense of belonging, and understanding. Space can give us that, but the journey of a thousand miles to the cost and the time, people say this is too, too, you're 100 years too soon. It's too expensive. The journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, and we haven't even taken the first step. And if we don't get a National Defense Authorization Act, We've been given, we will be giving our competition that has taken tremendous leaps into this future two years of compound interest in the bank ahead of us. That 120 mile an hour car on our bumper will be two miles in front of us and they'll put up those barriers. They'll throw out those tacks onto the road so our tires deflate. We may have a better car, but without good tires, you aren't going anywhere. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. All right. Thank you. Thank you and thank everyone for coming. Thank you.